All righty. Good morning, everyone. On uh, Facebook land, if you care to call it that, I don't know what you want to call it anymore because, you know, social media is weird. Um, so today we have a great episode. We're going to be talking with Ben Pierce. My name is also Ben. His name is Ben. So there's a lot of Benology happening right now. So we're going to be talking to him. He is a local swamp photographer, and he's also executive director for both Swamp Base and the McGee's Swamp Tour. So we're going to be talking about that in just a little bit. So stay tuned. All right, Ben. So welcome to the podcast. Like you literally saw me um, setting everything up in this temporary space that I have here. So thank you for helping me a little bit with it. Absolutely. Pleasure to be here. So, um, so one thing I wanted you to do is go ahead and kind of let everybody know who you are and what you do. Cause I think most people are familiar with your photography, but um, you are definitely a part of other things in the swamp, the whole swamp scene essentially. Yeah. So go ahead and uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about, about yourself. So back in 2010, I moved back to Lafayette. I grew up here and joined with the Boy Scouts of America. At the time, they were celebrating the centennial of scouting. And through that, uh, we started to have it create a project to get scouts more involved in our natural areas here in Acadiana. And so that involved, obviously, our largest natural area here in the state, which is the Atchafalaya Basin. So I started getting involved with scouting, youth development activities, as well as that swamp land back then. And so over the last 13 years, I've really started to, I guess, created my career um, working and playing in the swamp. Yeah, that's awesome. So you're definitely a swamp person for sure. Um, and you said you've been doing photography for about 18 years, I think yeah. you said. Yeah, I started photography back in, in 2005 when I was at LSU. And I just uh, kind of got an interest in it at the time. It was an easy way to not have to draw or paint and uh, cap to capture something. And so that was kind of when the beginning of digital photography was really starting to take hold. Yeah. And to be able to delete bad photos was kind of fun instead of having to go down <laughs> to, you know, uh, the local pharmacy or whatever else and try to do a, you know, one hour development with film is, uh, was way more expensive and you never knew what you got. So yeah, it got me excited about it. That's awesome. So um, I want to touch a little bit more on the the swamp base aspect of your work. So that is your full time gig, right? So Correct. tell us a little bit more about swamp base and what what you do for that. Yes. What is it? So we are a five hundred one c three nonprofit. Uh, we were officially established in two thousand fifteen with our nonprofit status, but the whole idea for it stems back to that centennial of scouting. And when we were trying to figure out ways for them to be more engaged here in Acadiana, a lot of people actually, uh, if you really even still today talk to them, they still don't know that scouting exists as prevalently as it does. And it's such a great organization that provides excellent opportunities for youth and, and values. And this is the Boy Scouts, Boy right? Scouts, correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have the Evangel Area Council here in Acadiana. It represents the uh, eight traditional parishes. So we have scouts and volunteers throughout the area. And so back in 2010, we were looking for a great project to be able to have scouts engaged in the outdoors, and we looked at conservation activities there in the basin. And so that involved uh, planting trees and picking up trash, as well as other activities, just to try to get them more engaged in the area, as well as to show that the service work that scouting does and provides can be a benefit to, to communities and to nature. Okay, so... It's interesting. I went, I was in the Boy Scouts whenever I was little or more little than what I am now. Um, I was younger, like, God, uh, probably in my seven to 10 year old range, uh -huh. maybe 12. Um, I don't know how much Boy Scouts have changed since, but um, I, we spent a lot of time in the Chico Park area. Right. So um, I remember whenever I was in Boy Scouts, we would, uh, we carved a soap. Uh huh. Okay. Yep, yep. Uh, we learned how to tie several knots, and um, you know this, you know the typical outdoor type stuff. I've I've imprinted or stamped leather belts. I made mm -hmm. my own leather belt with my name on it, um, and that was the extent of my 
like memory at least of what Boy Scouts was to me. Obviously, Boy Scouts, you know, they're not known for selling cookies outside yeah. of grocery stores, uh, which I thought would have been cool as a young person. I, I mean, that's very a business savvy aspect that the Girl Scouts have, which I love. Um, but yeah, for me, Boy Scouts was very, uh, very insightful in the the short amount of time I was in there. I, I if I remember correctly, there's the is it the Wolves. Wolves would be second graders. Yeah. Okay. And then the, what's the first one? Is it just the Cubs? You're looking at like Tiger Cubs. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And I think I made it up to, uh, is it Weeblo? Weeblo. Yeah. You're yeah. in fourth or fifth grade for that. Yep. 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 And I always thought it would be cool to make, make it to Eagle, but uh, yeah, I don't know what happened, but never, I, I got out of it during the Weeblo uh, era of the Boy Scouts for me. And uh, yeah, just, it kind of went away. Well, I, I only had one year in scouting, so I was only in scouting in first grade. And, at, and when you're six years old, you don't really have the ability to make your own decisions about what you want to do extracurricular you right. know, wise. Uh, so I, had, I was playing soccer and baseball and everything else. And so it kind of went by the wayside. But having gone back and getting more involved with the organization as an adult and then realizing all the local leaders here in Acadiana that are Eagle Scouts, it blows your mind. You're going I mean, I think you had uh, Bob Giles on here recently in yeah. the podcast. Bob's an Eagle Scout. Uh, I mean, Matt Stuller's an Eagle Scout. So, I mean, some of the big names here in Acadiana that do great philanthropic work as well are all Eagles. And it's uh, it's neat to kind of have that here and that great presence here in Acadiana. Wow. I didn't realize there, there were all Eagle Scouts. I mean, obviously, that's not something that they, they talk about unless you, I guess, would ask them or if you you know right. know that. But that's that's really fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Scouting reaches a lot of different points in the community. And with the, even though they recently seem like they've changed membership standards to allow females into <clears throat> the, the program, uh, the females have been involved for, for decades, uh, but they're just now allowed to, to reach Eagle. So now we're going to find in the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, other leaders here in Acadiana will now be female Eagle Scouts as well. So that's going to be really neat. So that's, that's, that's an interesting, um, aspect of the boy scouts yeah so a boy correct me if i'm wrong Uh a boy can't be a girl scout not based on the standards of the girl scouts no but a girl can be a boy scout or is it just called a scout they've the organization has never changed its name with the membership standard change so it's still the boy scouts of america okay uh, what they've done is they've changed what's called the boy scout program so the boy scout program is follows what we call the trail to eagle so it's getting the advancements and the ranks uh, in order to receive the Eagle Scout Award. What they've done is they've changed it from Boy Scouts to Scouts BSA. And so they have boy troops and girl troops. Okay. So it, it allows them to both find that, that, that path. The thing, though, that I think is really great, and I've got a coworker who was an Eagle Scout and, or was a, a Girl Scout and went all the way through the program. When she was looking to um, get a scholarship for a university, had she been a boy at the time, who had Chief Eagle, she would have gotten five thousand dollars. Her Girl Scout award only gave her like two or three thousand dollars. So it was that award was different based on which program she was in. So she's like, man, if I had been an Eagle and the program had existed in the way it currently does, she was I would have had a little bit more money to be able to, you know, help pay for books or uh, tuition or, or lodging at a university. So it's, it's helped to even the playing field. And there are a lot of people throughout the country that are still um, kind of hesitant about accepting this, but I always look at it in, in a couple ways, but primarily because I've had, a, I had a, my father-in-law was doubted it originally. And I said, well, what would you rather have? Would you rather have 50% of your community or your young people being uh, patriotic and God fearing and community minded outdoor, you know, conscious, or would you rather have a hundred percent? And I think everyone can benefit from a hundred percent, Yeah, you know, of the people be able to get involved in that kind of okay. stuff. Okay. So, wow. Fascinating. So, so I do, I deal with scouting on, on a daily basis, uh, but the swamp base is a, is a program that has come out of the scouting program. It's, it's all about getting young people engaged in the outdoors challenging them, um, focusing on leadership attributes, communication, things like that. And we use the Atchafalaya Basin as our playground for that. Yeah. And speaking of playground, um, well, actually, 
I know if you're listening, you're probably going to want to know about his photography side. I'm going to bring that up in just a second. I do have to get my sponsors uh, mentioned here. So um, go ahead and stick around and we'll talk about the photography side and a little bit more about the, the Swamp Tour side. So first up, we have the Music Academy of Acadiana. Acadiana's top choice for you, music lessons. So if you're young, old, uh, a beginner or a a world-renowned, classically trained musician, you can always uh, probably improve yourself. So if you want to take classes at the Music Academy of Acadiana, they um, are open to anyone and everyone, any style. They teach students of all ages. Like I said, they have a very wide range of instruments that they'll teach. Uh, So obviously your voice is an instrument, but like drums, violin, saxophone, flute. They even teach audio production They've premiered on major TV music contests like American Idol, which I think is back. Uh, I didn't know if it left, but it's apparently back. And then they've been on The Voice. Uh, It's founded locally by uh, UL Lafayette Music School graduate Tim Benson. Uh, He's also in an emo cover band that is kind of making a comeback as far as music genre goes. Uh, They've won multiple awards throughout the years, but they are... Super, super dedicated as a music company and locally founded. Um, their goal is to make music lessons fun, educational, and to help foster the next generation of musicians and creative thinkers. And you can check their website out. It's musicacademyacadiana.com. It's on your screen there. I know there's kind of like a uh, thing in front or kind of behind the letter, so it might be a little hard to see, but musicacademyacadiana.com. And if you're listening, um, yeah, I just told you, and you can always go to the caption of the video or the audio podcast, too, to see the website. And you can also find them on Facebook and all that good stuff. And then we have Chase Group Construction. Chase Group Construction is founded locally also by a Chase Landry, who is a, basically the firm is a general contractor and land developer, combination that specializes in planning and design and construction as a design build company and they combine both aspects of being a a contractor with the aspects of being an architect so they can bring your vision from that a vision to reality so it's a really great company like i said founded locally by chase landry you can check out their website chasegroupconstruction.com it's also on your screen if you need to screenshot this at all Uh, and if you want to learn more about chase group construction you can reach out to me directly on the facebook page for me to kind of help you uh, learn more and um, if you want to get connected with chase landry i can help you with that too but his website's there so anyway we are going to talk more about this uh, photography side and all the, the Swamp Tour stuff that Ben Pierce has. Because I've been following Ben uh, at least for a couple months now after uh, his photography has been surfacing on my feed multiple times. <laughs> and he's actually, uh, kudos to you, you just made 30,000 followers on Facebook, right? Yeah. yeah. So that is a quite an achievement. I mean, uh, that's, that's half of what I have. <laughs> Which is yeah, great. I'm, tr- I'm trying to catch you. We'll, we'll see. Look, I'm telling you, you your posts uh, blow up, and for good reason. Your photography is amazing. Um, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off my my sponsor logos here because I don't want it to be in front of the photos that I'm about to show everyone. So, you have nine photos that you sent over. Mm-hmm. And we're going to cycle through them and talk about each one because I think they're fascinating. And one of them in particular, just I, I really like this one because of the what's in it and how it looks. But we're going to start from the first one right here. So this image, and you can probably yep. see it, <clears throat> looks almost as if this is taken in Tennessee. Very close. Very close. This is Western North Carolina. Okay. So I love the dimension and the the, the subtle kind of changes of, um, I don't know what you call that, the, the, the opacity of the, the hills and the mountains uh-huh. in the back. Like that look right there, that that is a money shot if I ever saw it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that shot. So just a quick background on my photography and yeah. the interest in it. Um, went to LSU. That's when I started kind of getting into ph- photography. I was a studied landscape architecture and land planning. And whenever I graduated, I moved to Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, So I lived out there, my wife and I did for about three and a half years. And because it's such a different terrain than growing up here in South Louisiana, not a lot of sugarcane fields out there in the mountains. 
I was fascinated <clears throat> by documenting that place. And it was at the very early stages of Facebook when you still had to have a university email address. Oh, that's early. That's, that's OG kind of uh, Facebook member, right? And so I would sit there and take photos, post them on Facebook or onto Flickr, which was still a big thing back then too, for family and friends back at home. Because it's like, hey, look, all, I mean, bayous and all that stuff, that's pretty and neat. We grew up with that. Yeah. Cane fields and all. But we don't have, you, you don't have this. And so I really, I, I made a, a big effort to, every weekend when I had availability to get out on the roads, ride the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is where that was shot from, and just explore the, the mountainsides, the creeks, the waterfalls, and things like that. And would have a good friend usually in tow, and we'd talk and hang out and kind of critique each other along the way about, with our images. And so I kind of fell in love with it really at that point. And it was a lot of it was going, man, this is a beautiful area to share with other people. And then as we kind of get exploring down here, I'll tell you a little bit about why kind of my, my focus obviously changed. But the, the mountains of North Carolina and, and the Gatlinburg area in Tennessee, I mean, people from this area travel there all the time. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. We but, actually have a trip to get to Tennessee in April. It's, it's amazing, right? Yep. It's a beautiful place. But in order to get images like that, you have to really work hard for it. You've got to be up before you know, the sun rises and by being up before the sun rises, you got to be up hours before the sun rises in order to get to a spot like set this. It may have taken you know, two, two and a half hours just to drive to that spot, set up, and you're in the complete dark, and you've got your fingers crossed. You hope it's going to be pretty. You hope it's not going to be overcast or the colors aren't going to be Right, bright, so. right. And, you know, I mean, if as long as there's not too many crazy clouds or overcast, usually you're going to get a good kind of photo typically. Right. But it's really magical when the clouds kind of work with the sun and kind of create this kind of like – uh, oh my gosh, the lights just went off in here, but it looks fine, I guess. Uh, I'll turn them on in just a second. So, yeah, so this is, what did you, what did you say? You said Blue Ridge? This is, the, yeah, this is actually, you're looking at the Pisgah National Forest, which is a, a big chunk of forest land that's protected by um, the National Park Service, and it's adjacent to the Blue Ridge Parkway. Oh, nice. I love it. All right, so we're going to we're gonna move on a little bit here. So this photo... Um, it almost looks photoshopped. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> How in the world was there just like this one lone tree in the middle of what looks like a channel? Yeah. Yeah. So this is at Lake Martin, which is just here in St. Martin Parish, just uh, 20 minutes or so outside of Lafayette. Uh, for the record, every one of my images are photoshopped. And anybody who's worth anything in the photography game is going to have Photoshop. Right, Photoshop right. has become a negative term to people who don't understand what Photoshop actually is. Okay, let me let me clarify. <laughs> I was hoping we'd get to talk about let this. Let me clarify. <laughs> we're, we're definitely going to talk about Photoshop because I've used Photoshop for years. Um, what I meant, I guess, is that the tree doesn't look like it's organically placed in the like center. Superimposed into the yes. image. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. That's whenever, yeah, yeah. when I use the word Photoshopped, that's what I gotcha. mean. Gotcha. Now I know Photoshop as a developing tool right. is what it is. Yeah. You, 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 you use, um, what do they call that? Um, is it overlays or, uh, mm -hmm. there's some other terms. I, I, I used to be big into photography a few years ago and then I, I'm in it still, but in a different capacity. But um, I used to edit in Photoshop a lot, and I would have do all the vignettes and work with the brushes and right. do the different uh, uh, transparencies and uh, clipping mask, all this stuff that you have to do. But um, I would be interested. It would be interesting to see like the original. Like I'd love to see a comparison. I don't know if you do that. I'll do that every once in a while. Okay. Yeah, I'm on my page. I try to be as <clears throat> transparent as I possibly can with you know, to my followers, because I'm just a guy who just likes to take photos Yeah, and to have people following and, and showing, you know, so much support to me. I mean, I've been doing it for a long time and it's, it's, it's definitely an honor, but it's in humbling at the same time. But I mean, I'm, I'm here to teach you like, we're only get to live one time. We got one life here. And so why would I hold my secrets to myself uh, secrets? I mean, anybody can do this, but why would I hold my secrets to myself when you know other people want to have a creative outlet too? Yeah. So, um, you know, in this one, Everything I shoot is going to be in what's called a raw format. So it's, it has all of the data basically there within the image. So it's not going to look very good if you saw it right, right. out of the camera. Raw, it, I mean, that's... Raw, the, the, I mean, just like what you yes. think. It, you know, there's nothing been done to it at all. And so you, do, you don't have the contrast. You might not have some of the saturation there, uh, the way that the highlights and the shadows are going to be a little bit different. And you have to bring that out. When it, what it comes down to, though, is photography is an art form. So 
how I see the photo is how I want to see the photo as an artist and how somebody else perceives it. It's up to them. They may like it. They may go, Hey, look, it'd be nice if you got rid of that tree. Well, the tree was there. It grew in that, yeah. in that channel. It's a young, small cypress compared to what's around it. But you know, what I do is going to be reflective on what I like and, you know, to have people like it, that's, that's great. But I don't shoot for other people. I shoot for Right. Myself. You can't shoot for other people because then you're not, you're not fulfilled as right. an artist. Um, so we have a comment. So Natalie Doyle says, I love his photography. They are so gorgeous and shows the beauty of our state. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, that. Thank yeah, you, Doyle. The, the, the photography and me getting back into, I guess, so from coming, going from North Carolina and then moving back to Louisiana, uh, when I got here, I, I remembered my time there. And in North Carolina, you have so many different conservation organizations that are trying to uh, preserve the beautiful hillsides and mountains of, of that area in Western North Carolina. I'm sure they've got the same in Tennessee, but here in Louisiana, we just don't have that. We we're behind the times when it comes to making sure that our natural areas are protected. So if I was to get on a soapbox for a second, if you don't mind, you know, that that's important thing for me growing up here in Lafayette and living in Louisiana, most of my life, we've got a beautiful state and the landscape we have is second to none. I mean, we have people traveling from literally all over the world to visit Louisiana, you know, they've got our, we've got our culture and our food and our music, but which, which keeps them here too. It keeps them here, but they want to see the beauty of our swamplands and our bayous. And so we just don't have that big group of people who are positively promoting this place. And if you talk to anybody, you sit there and you go into any restaurant here or business and start talking to them about getting out into the swamp. If they hadn't been out there before, they're thinking of mosquitoes and they're worrying about, <laughs> snakes or alligators, oh, yeah. all the negative things. And so all the negatives. These opportunity, opportunities to show beautiful images of what our state really is without allowing it to be a stereotype, I think is something that is just super positive for our future protection of these areas. Yeah. All right. Um, I just want to make sure that those that are listening to the audio version of this podcast, I, I am sorry that we can't show you the photos, but if you go to our YouTube channel, the T podcast, you can look at the photos yourself while we're talking about them. So if you do listen to the audio version, thank you. Um, but go watch the video version too. So you can see kind of what we're talking about if you aren't familiar. Um, so we just had another comment come through from a in start nutrition scott uh hi you guys amazing view all right cool thank you all right so um i i, I understand what you were saying too um about you know promoting our state and with the beauty and all that good stuff and i think what you're doing especially is really putting a uh, a super positive light on the swamp area um like I said, I've been, I started following you a few months now. I, I don't know how long exactly, but it's been a while. And just every time you post a photo, first of all, I notice that it blows up. Like so many people crazy. love it. And I, and I love that people <laughs> love it. And your photos are just crazy. Like, for example, this one right here, um, that is an egret, right? That's actually a great blue heron, <coughs> but close. There's, okay. It's, it's a big waiting bird. Yep. So... Just another great photo. Like, is that natural fog? Yeah, that was Dude. that was taken up at uh, in Caddo Lake, which is uh, northeast Texas, just west of Shreveport, uh, thirty minutes or so. Yeah, about a four hour drive from here. A beautiful cypress forest up there. Um, great bayous and and things like that. And the fog was on the river or on the bayou that morning. So I came out of a cypress forest saw the heron from a distance and then it's just trying to do little tiny micro paddles in my kayak to not make too much noise, not move too fast because you don't want to scare it away. And so you just kind of get to that point where you're, I, I like I like to joke that I feel like I'm playing twister often in my kayak yeah. because I'm contorting my body in different ways in order to try to like be quiet, but also get the right angle. And so you just had, I just had to sneak up on this guy, get as close as I could without scaring him away. But yeah, that's the fog that was kind of billowing off of the, of the bayou. The bayou was warmer than the swamp area was. And so it just created this great fog. I love it. And dude, he looks totally unbothered. Like you got up there. Care. Great. And you probably have a good lens that you can zoom in too. Yeah. A little bit. I, I'm looking for some donations, you know, All right. you always, you always <laughs> use better ones, but um, you know, you get as close as you can and yeah. you, just, you try to be quiet. What I love about the kayaking aspect of the photography is that I'm I'm basically can kind of blend into the landscape there. So the alligators, the the birds and everything, I can get a lot closer to them than if I was in a motorboat, you know? Right. 
You don't. You should have pull, uh, pulled an Ace Ventura. Is it Ace Ventura where he has the little fan and he sticks it in the water <laughs> and the boat starts going? <laughs> All right. So, oh wait, we got another comment. Oh, Natalie Doyle again. It's hard to talk about the beauty of the swamp when I talk about it to out-of-state friends. I love to share his photos and show what I am talking about. Yeah. So there you go. Thank that you. that's that's the connection there. All right. So this one, uh, I'll be honest. If you told me this is Louisiana, I'd tell you you're lying. Tell me that it's Louisiana. It's not. God, all right. <laughs> okay. We don't have we don't have indigenous rocks here in Louisiana. I know. That would be so that would be that would be That looks like a different. Tennessee type thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually right there on the border of Tennessee and North Carolina. Oh, uh, I see, dude, yep. calling it. Yep. So this is just outside well, it's actually um, so just outside of um, the uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, maybe it might be in there, uh, pretty close to it. This is Big Creek, which is just a really beautiful, uh, large creek that's not really very popular for people visiting the national park. So a lot of people will go to Cades Cove. They'll go up to the, the high mountains, and they're just kind of outside of Gatlinburg. But this is uh, on the north end of the park, and you don't have as many people visiting out here. So it's quiet, great, easy trail for people. Um, and then you've got this kind of raging um, creek that runs along the, the whole way. And those boulders right there are actually really big. You don't have a scale. But, I mean, that one that, that's kind of right there in the foreground is probably at least the size of a, a small car. I mean, we're talking about big rocks. Really? Yeah. Good grief. Yeah, I know the perspective on it right now makes it look like the rock is it's still a good size. Yeah, but it's, it's big. Dang. Okay, so in 2021, we went to Tennessee, same area we're going to uh, next month. And just driving on this, like, like these little, like windy roads in the, like the, I guess the mountains, if you want to call it, um, there's creeks that run along a lot of the roads mm -hmm. and, uh, the kind of specifically where I'm talking about is like near the where's Valley area. Um, and so we were going to Cades Cove. Funny that you said that, uh, which is okay. It's an, an, it's a, it's a cool place, but it's, it's really populated with vehicles that are slow. Right. Going through, which yeah. I get it. But uh, other than that, it's it's a it's it's relatively flat. You have mountain views kind of surrounding, but there's like a couple of old churches. So if you're going to Tennessee at ever at any point in time, if you've never been to that area, Kate's Cove is nice. If you want to see a, a live bear family that's just kind of out and about without being caged, that's a great place to go potentially see them. I we saw some live bears out there and like no cage, just just chilling yeah. under a tree. Um, but other than that, like to see places like what you're seeing here, you really got to go in places where I guess is lower traffic or right. kind of the unique little spots. And, but the Creek on the side of the road that I'm talking about, uh, we went, I, 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 I got brave. I went onto the rocks into the water. Now it wasn't, it, it I don't think it was as fast as what you're, you're showing here, but, uh, I was still nervous and I was on some pretty big rocks and it was just the best, best photo that I've ever taken. Uh, Cause I was like, we don't have this in Louisiana. We right. have nice things in Louisiana, yeah. like, and we're about to get to some more. Uh, but yeah, just you know, going to places with higher elevation changes, and like, I don't know, it's just it's really cool. I I, I don't want to keep rambling. Um, all right, so next photo. So this this looks like Louisiana. You're right. Good guess. All right, cool. Because <laughs> it's cypress trees, it's uh, moss. It looks like another herring or yep. egret. Um, so tell me about this photo. So this is another one here locally, obviously here in Acadiana, and again, I see these, the birds from a distance and you kind of try to, you're trying to make an image out of uh, utilizing the birds. They provide some scale to it. So I saw the heron sitting there on this, this branch that's kind of in a, a little bit of flooded area. And again, slowly kind of sneaking up on it with the kayak. What I wanted to do is really figure out a way to get aligned the, the heron with the sun, with the sun and, yeah. the, and the reflection of the sun that was rising. So you could see that, see kind of the reflection of the heron in the, in the, right there in the reflection of the sun. And so that takes a lot of patience. There's a many a time where I'll be on the water and I, I got that perfect shot lined up and the bird flies away. Mm. And if you were next to me, you'd hear me say some adult words <laughs> to the bird or, you know, and sometimes it's like, God, come on, turn your head just a little bit this way, buddy. I mean, come on, do you want to, you want to be in this image or not? And then they fly away and squawk and like, well, you know, that's what keeps me coming back for that. Next yeah. Year. Maybe there'll be another shot, but these are special moments, you know, especially when you have the wildlife because you're never going to see that again. And that's what I do love about photography is like, even if you go back to that Creek or the, the other mountain one, 
like that, that's captured a moment. Like that literally that, that second that you, you push the shutter button will never be seen again by another human. And what I love about my home state here, Louisiana, is that again, we don't have this awesome perception necessarily nationwide, especially our swamps. And we got to get people to have an appreciation here locally, which is great for all the local followers that I have on my page, but also be able to share that internationally. And so having people champion, like I think some of your viewers here that were commenting and sharing it with people outside of the state, that's a huge benefit for us. And so we can all serve as kind of our own little quasi ambassadors for Louisiana through imagery and, and the social media platform that we have available to us now provides an excellent opportunity for us to be able to do Oh, so. definitely. All right. So we have a couple more comments. So Natalie Doyle says again, my husband wants to take me to Tennessee for our anniversary. If I get to see sites like this, I can't wait. And then um, we got in start nutrition. Say I came to Louisiana just to visit a family member and was, and this was eight years ago. I fell in love with Lafayette. So here I am. Awesome. Yeah. And then, so Natalie, just look, these two are just commenting. I'm, 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 I won't be able to read all of them, guys, but I'm going to try. So Natalie goes, how many states, how many different places have you been to to take photos? You, uh, quite a few. Um, the, the real passion, though, for me and what I like to share the most, though, is going to be Louisiana imagery just because it's the home state. But I've been all over the place from, you know, obviously the Gulf Coast and and shooting over in the Gulf Shores, Orange Beach area and down the Florida um, Peninsula, uh, Texas. I've done some stuff out there, California, Michigan. I go up to Michigan all the time for family. And, um, you know, there's beautiful areas. And again, you can find you can find beautiful places all across the country that are not that, you know, busy spot like you know like a Gatlinburg or some like a uh, Yellowstone National Park you can find beautiful places just outside of those spots too you just got to explore and kind of you know open your mind to seeing something different I know everybody wants that that perfect shot for the for Instagram yeah right and it's usually the very popular spots like I know on TikTok there's videos that make fun of like they'll show like what you're expecting yeah and then reality and it's like hundreds of people trying to take the same photo that you're taking like it, while it's amazing to try to get that photo, it's also depressing on how many people are there trying to get that same image. I, I've shown up to a spot just recently when I was up at Caddo, and I, I was like, man, I'm up here. It's, it's 4.30 in the morning. It should be dead. It shouldn't be anybody here. And there's, you know, 25 um, folks who are all set up with their tripods in the, in the pitch black waiting for two hours for the sun to come up. And I'm like, man, I got to go somewhere else. I'm like, like, I mean, I could sit right there shoulder to shoulder, but... There's no creativity in the fact that we're all basically getting the generally the same composition. So I want to have something that's going to be completely different and is uniquely mine. And that's when like you go paddling out and get in the kayak and go try to find that heron on that, on that branch or, or some other kind of shot, you got to look for something different. And you know, that's just the challenge and the chase for me. I if I'm going to shoot the same thing as somebody else sitting next to me, it's kind of boring. Yeah, no, I totally get it. Okay. So moving on to the next one. Yep. All right. So um, I'm guessing this is, Louisiana as well. Yep. Okay. Where is this taken? Most of the ones I've shared with you here are going to either be the Chafly or Lake Martin. It's just yep. really convenient for us to be able to get to those places here in Lafayette. So easy to, to travel over to those spots. Uh, this would be a sunrise shot. I love the silhouettes because it really shows the character of the cypress trees. But to be able to capture images like that and be there at the right place at the right time, because I hear that a lot from people. It's like, man, you're always in the right place at the right time. Well, there's a lot of research and work that goes into that. The being able to know how to utilize your camera to its best of its abilities is one part of it, but being able to sit there and say, is this going to be a good day? That's going to provide me good opportunities for, for images. And at this point, having done this for now for 18 <coughs> years, I'm pretty picky about what the days are. And so I'm looking for low winds. I'm looking for some humidity, uh, maybe a little bit of some light clouds in the sky. And then of course, kind of what time it might be in the year, you know, seasonally, am I looking yeah. for a certain, you know, fall color? Am I looking for the, the spring green leaves that we're going to be seeing here across the area right now? And so like an image like this, it may have been, you know, seven to 10 days of kind of just following the weather patterns, you know, listening to our local meteorologists, kind of trying to figure out what they're thinking and then kind of doing my own research on the, on the end and saying, is everything going to align? And if it doesn't for me, I'm probably sleeping in on that Saturday morning. If it, if it does align though, I'm up bright and early, got that adrenaline going. Oh and yeah. I'm, I'm trying to chase the sun. And this is, this night. is okay. I'm you, you take me as a guy who probably likes to fish. 
I hate fishing. You hate fishing? I hate fishing. Okay, great. So this is your fishing. <laughs> this is my, yeah, this is my fishing and this is my fishing and hunting is this. I shoot with a different type of, you know, okay. thing than, a, you know, yeah. I, if I, I've had a lot of people go, man, I, I bet you got a, you know, you know, a pole with you when you're out there. I'm like, I wouldn't have time to, to do this. I mean, I'd be sitting there worrying about the fish and then I'm missing the shot. So I, I've kind of never really wasn't into it as a kid. And so this is better for me anyway. I get a little bit of exercise. A lot of times I'll paddle a couple miles or so when I'm on the water. And then I get something that I get to come, come home with. So I kind of joke at like my photography for me personally, though, is kind of like a collection. Like yeah. if you're a collector, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm capturing my own collection here. And, uh, and, I've only, and I've got one of ones, you know. Nobody else has got that same shot. I've right, got that right. shot. Uh, so I'm, I'm a collector that has, who's got, you know, kind of the best of what he wants. So I know you probably have seen uh, when when guys go out fishing and they get a fish, they always have to take a photo or a profile photo with their fish in the shot. Yep. And but this is your trophy fish here. I right. mean, like whenever you post a photo, like it, it's just it's really unique, and that's why I'm I'm loving the fact that we're we can show them here because, um, just just to be able to talk about it and kind of get the perspective, of like how you took it and all that good stuff. It's it's really fascinating, um, Yari. Es, oh my God! I, I'm sorry if I say your name wrong. Yari Espino. Ah, she, he. This person says, "Oh my God, where was that photo taken?" You said Lake Martin. Yeah, this is at Lake Martin. Lake Martin. Okay, and that's in Saint Martin Parish, right. correct? Yeah. Yep. Just between uh, Bro Bridge and Lafayette. Yeah. So, like, I post. I try to post daily, every couple of days or whatever, just because I've got. I've got lots of images and people like different things and you yeah. never know if there's going to be somebody who's interested in having, you know, a new photo printed on, you know, fine art paper or canvas that could be on their office or home or their, their camp and, and things. But, you know, getting out there and just seeing the beauty is what drives me every single day to as, as often as I can to be on the, on the water and, and posting. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Y'all don't see the ugly pictures on the bad ones and the <laughs> ones that are poor compositions and out of focus and all that stuff too. There's plenty of those. So anybody who's sitting there, you know, listening and going, I don't think I can do this myself. To me, I'm, I've always just been my biggest critic, but also my biggest fan. And by doing that, it just keeps me moving forward with yeah. trying, trying new things. And I, I don't want to put something that I, I don't personally think is excellent in my opinion. Now, a, you know, somebody else might not think so, but for me personally, I like it. If I like it, then I'll probably post it. Okay. Love it. And then Yari says, uh, yes, S S B no. S B no. Okay. You did, Got her. You did I, pretty I, good with that. I guess I did. All right. Next photo. We have three more. So we're 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 on our roll here. All right. So this one, I mean, this this screams Louisiana. Uh, I guess um, I'm guessing same. I'm guessing Saint Martin, La yep. Lake Martin. Yep. Yep. That's also Lake Martin. That yeah. seems to be a pretty popular spot. So easy, man. I I can wake up a little bit later and I'm there in 25 minutes. So yeah. I don't have to sit there and take the long drive somewhere else. All right. So, tell us a little bit about this. Are alligators? I, from from what I understand, they shouldn't be that hard to take photos of. Typically, alligators are just chilling for the most they're part. Chill. Yeah. yeah. They're chill. So, but how often do you see alligators? I mean, you're on Lake Martin. Um, you're, you're, you're just paddling around in your kayak. Like, do you see them often or like, what is it? What does your encounters look like with that? Outside of real cold weather, when they're, alligators don't hibernate, they, they, they do this thing called brumation where they just basically kind of get into the mud for a temporary period of time. So if it's cold there, you're not going to see them, but if it's warm weather every single time. Okay. And it's, the count could be, you know, just a handful to 40 of them or so, you know, in a morning if I'm out on the water. And I'm only on the water for a couple hours usually. Once the light's bad, again, I told you I'm picky. Once the light's bad, I got things to do. I got to go cut grass. I got to go hang out with the family. Yeah. You know? So I, I got other things to do uh, on the weekends. But, yeah, like alligators are pretty chill. I try to make sure that, again, with the platform that I have, just like you do with developing Lafayette, I want to make sure that I'm utilizing it to the best of its abilities. And it should be a positive experience for people. Um, so when I talk about alligators, I show a photo of alligators. A lot of times I'll have people go, oh, be careful, you know, watch out, don't get bit, all these things. And uh, uh, thank you. But alligators are really shy. Yeah. Um, they're really docile. They, they chill. <clears throat> and I'm often the one chasing them. They don't chase me. So they're you're like, the on. aggressor I, I'm here. like, buddy, come on back. Come on. I, I, I got to get, get that right angle. Come on. What are you doing? Like, don't swim away. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I'm always looking for alligators just because they're so, um, you know, Obviously, you know, Louisiana, deep south type of a creature 
that they're great to be able to show. And I think they're a great kind of mascot for our place that we have here in yeah, Acadiana. I love it. Natalie says she has to run, but she'll catch the replay and uh, to say have a, have a great Friday and happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you, too. All right. So two more photos here. Now, the next photo, personally, is my favorite of the bunch at the moment. I really did like the the cypress tree, that the lone cypress tree on the channel. That was my next favorite. But this one right here that I'm about to show is my favorite because I just I love the, the way the ground looks, it just looks so thirsty and it just the cracks, they, the cracks look like two to three feet deep. Like they it just, this, it's a very unique photo and the stump and the, 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 the sky being nice and blue and the, the contrast of the Brown. And like, I love this photo. I, I can't say it enough. Tell me this is, where is this taken? It looks like another St. Lake, Lake Martin, but I don't know the, what part. This one isn't actually is in Henderson. Okay. And so with my ties and, you know, we work with McGee Swamp Tours uh, exclusively out there and, and the great tours that they provide. Um, this this happened during the drawdown last fall. And you may have heard about that. There were some yeah. some news outlets that had been covering it. But they, they had a drawdown out there last fall that was to, to help to solidify the bottoms of the lake, to remove invasive vegetation, to clean the lake, things like that. They've been trying to do it for, for years and to you know, modest success. But we had a really great opportunity this past fall where they had the drawdown, but we also had very little rain during September and October. And so that allowed that whole area to really dry out. There's still some water out there in the lake, but some of the areas where the, the larger cypress forests are was completely dry like this. So when you were walking around out there, it really felt like you were in another planet. And so you had these cypress stumps that have been cut 100 years plus ago that were now really well exposed, and they kind of almost looked like they were like jetting out of the soil. Below. Yeah. And I spent as much time as I possibly could out there, uh, go out to McGee's and then and launch my boat or, or go paddle out to that and just kind of walk around and see this place in a completely different way than it's ever been seen before, at least for me personally. Um, yeah, I found random artifacts when I was out there walking around. Nothing nothing like you would think of like piles of junk, but I'd find uh, Coke bottles that were probably, you know, you know, 40 or 50 years old. Opened, right? Opened, yeah, yeah, they're okay. open. Um, but it was interesting because you'd find like a little, if you find like a little pile of, you know, litter that's still out there, and it's mostly it was glass that was still left. Everything else would have kind of rotted away. Even the metals had kind of just deteriorated. The glass you'd find, you could tell like where a houseboat would have been positioned at one point. So I felt like an archaeologist kind of walking around too, as much as a photographer, because I'd see, you know, a bunch of these, these glass bottles, you know, Clorox, big glass Clorox bottles, and you, you could look at the bottom of them, and you'd be like, all right, look, here's where it was bottled. So I could go, whoever was here fishing or on a houseboat was from Lafayette or Lake Charles, Alexandria. There was one from Beaumont and Shreveport, New Orleans. People would come to this area, and they bought their Cokes or whatever, or Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, back home, and they'd come to the Atchafalaya for recreation. And that's where they d disposed of it. Now, we tried to remove as many of them as we possibly could, but um, it was kind of neat just to sit there and kind of pull these stories together that would have been, you know, decades old. Yeah, now, now, okay. So talk, talking about finding stuff uh, after the water is drained. Um, <laughs> I hope I not. I hope I don't know where you're going. With okay, this. <laughs> you probably know where I'm going with this. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I, as a young boy, I was, I, I was told a few stories, and I don't know how real or fake they were. Now, this is whenever I was growing up in the Turkey Creek area. We had a place called the uh, the the pits. And the pits was a lot of sand. It looked like a little mini desert area, but there was there was like a pond there. And my dad or my grandpa, I think it might have been my dad, he would always try to scare me from going into the pits by myself. And some of the things he would tell me is that you know in that in that water right there, there's uh, there's barrels of dead bodies under the water. And I'm going, oh, okay, that's weird. Now, as a little boy, I, it kind of intrigued me because I'm like, you know, now I want to go right. potentially check. <laughs> but, like, also, like, I don't want to see a dead body. Like, I don't want yep. something like that to happen. So this is where I'm going. Have you or anyone that you know have discovered, I guess, deceased in the Rema in remains of remains yeah. in, in this or barrels that are questionable like have you have you guys spotted or like what's your experience and stuff like that no nothing nothing 
nothing. It's not nearly as exciting like that as you would expect. I mean, they, again, the things that we have to overcome as a state and in this environment itself too, we talk about mosquitoes and the alligators, right? And, and the humidity and things like that. But when people think of swamps nationally, a lot of times they're thinking about what they saw on CSI yeah. or some other, you know, mystery novel or movie or things like that. So we have to combat Hollywood as much as anything else. Look, if you were doing something like that, you know, any place would probably could be a spot. But these these environments are often negatively portrayed, unfortunately. And so that's what, you know, working with the scouts and our programs with Swamp Base, my, my personal stuff with photography, uh, the swamp tours that we do with McGee's or any of the others across the area, we have to break those misconceptions. And we have to start really looking at ourselves here locally about getting a better understanding of our place. Because if we're going to be the ones talking about it, we need to have we need to know what we're actually talking about. Right. And so I encourage people to get out there and, and see this place. You know, don't have blinders on and don't let somebody else portray or, or help to create your own opinion of it. Go out there and see it for yourself and experience it. Okay. So... Safe to say no dead bodies were ever found. No dead bodies. I don't I don't hope to ever see any dead bodies. I'm not planning to go out there looking for them either. Right, right, right. Nobody's <laughs> nobody I don't I, I would hope nobody's looking for them unless you're like a police or like investigator. Well, I don't that's what I'm saying. I don't want to be on some kind of task force to go help find <laughs> right. them. I'm not, I'm not interested in, in, yeah. in being that guy. So but that's that's good to know. So as much time that you've spent in the swamp area, you haven't seen anything like that. No. Awesome. No. No. That should, and so people that are listening, that should comfort you. So if you want to go kayaking, it's probably a safe bet that you're not going to come across a, a body. Kayaking is super, it's again, the, all the things that scare people, they, people worry about snakes. I never see snakes or anything like they that. Probably, I mean, they probably don't even come up to you. They don't, if they, they, don't if they to were me. to see you. Big water, like in Henderson, especially, there's just not snakes there. They don't have, they need land, right? The mosquitoes aren't as bad because you don't have land. And la- without land, you don't have mammals. Without the mammals, the mosquitoes have nothing to eat. They don't just sit there on the surface waiting for fish to jump out of the water. And they try, try to tag the fish. Yeah. Like, oh, got the blood, that little drop of blood. They don't do that. So, you know, these areas are, again, con- continue to be mis- and, you know, misrepresented. And because of that, people are often scared about going yeah. into them. Now, when you go across I-10 on the bridge between Lafayette and Baton Rouge, I mean, how many times have you looked over the bridge and gone, man, how pretty is that? I would love to be down there. Yeah, uh, all the time. You should, you should feel that way because it is an amazing wilderness to explore. Okay, so this is definitely uh, lowering some barriers for myself. If if it, if anything, come with me. I, I will. I will. Dude, I, will I would love that one. On. Uh, now I don't know about getting up at the butt crack of dawn, because <laughs> oh, I know that's your favorite thing to do. But we'll see. Maybe one day. Oh my gosh! Um, all right, last photo, um, and then we'll we'll kind of start to close out. So those that are watching, uh, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, we got obviously the amazing photos that are keeping you guys around. So that's good. Uh, not just two talking heads here. Okay. So this photo, whenever I first saw it uh, uh, yesterday, whenever you sent it to me, I said, this is fake. Yeah. This yeah, is yeah. fake. That moonshot fake. The trees just look too just polished. I, everything looked polished. I, but the, the, the main thing, I thought that moon was fake. I said, no. So I'm pretty sure it's real. Um, yeah, so tell me about this shot. Is it also Lake Martin? It, this was Lake Martin. This was back in February during the full moon. Um, the, I try to plan if I can, if the conditions are right, to be on the water when the when the full moon is either yeah. rising or setting just because it's it only happens once a month, and you're lucky if the conditions are perfect for you. So this was my – I posted this photo. It's called Call of the Rougarou, and I posted this back last month, and it's this has been basically um, kind of my, you know, number one photo view wise I've I've reached over a million people with this photo all across the world. And it's because that striking moon right there. Now I'll give you a little, a little, little secret on how things work sometimes. So you have to worry about exposures when it comes to photography, you know, bright objects become overexposed. And when you're trying to um, bring out light in darker subjects. So this is actually what I would consider. It's a photo. It's a photo of a single image within a five second period but I have to expose for the, the moon separately than the, the cypress tree. So you do bracketing? I, I, I basically do bracketing that way. And so the moon was taken right after I composed it with the tree. Otherwise, I've got a very, very dark tree that you can't see 
or I have a very, very overexposed yeah. moon. So I basically take both images and I put them together in order to create the final product. Again, this is art, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it is a single moment. It's not like that moon was pulled away from, you know, an image taken five years ago or the cypress tree was added, you know, superimposed into the shot. So there is some things that, you know, kind of the tricks of the <coughs> trade that you have to do in order to create an image that really is, is so yeah so telling. So essentially for those that are kind of that may be confused about this, it's essentially HDR. A little bit. High yeah, dynamic you could, range. You could, you could say that. Yeah. yeah. It typically HDR has three or more photos. Um, you said this is only two photos? Two photos, yeah. yeah. One, one for one for literally the moon itself, not even the reflection. The reflection in the cypress tree and all that is everything was at the same time. The moon though had to be shot separately in order for it to be exposed right and because i mean i think that's what made me think it was fake at first even though it is real so yari it is real i know you just asked um the moon is very well defined yeah and to get a where a very well defined moon you got to put all of your focus on the moon and exposing just that and everything else around it will be dark um so this looks great um i i tried to take a photo of the moon with my iphone the uh, the other night it was a pretty solid moon, and I I basically I was trying to see how because I have an iPhone and I was trying to see how the, what it would do compared to what the Samsung was doing, and apparently what Samsung is doing is AI generated moon shots. So if you're taking a photo <laughs> of the moon with your Samsung and you're bragging to everybody, just want to let you know that it's not 100% your lens taking that. It's a computer. It's partially computer generated, so not all of it is uh, really actually taken. So um, Apple really hasn't done that to to fake a moonshot yet. So maybe they will. Maybe we'll get that feature in another couple of years. I need to get that for myself. This would make my job right. so much It'd easier. Make your job easier. Um, so yeah, this this is a really cool shot, and you know, just the fact that it's like yellowy looking, like that, like that. I don't know that like eerie looking moon. It just it's a really nice shot. Right as it's setting, you know, on the horizon, that's when you've got all the atmosphere right there. That So when you watch the moon rise, you know, it's that big yellow orange type of color. And that's the same thing as it sets too. But we just often don't see the set because it's so early in the morning. Right. Gosh. Okay. So we, we, we talked about all the photos and I want to kind of go back to you for a second. I don't think I asked are you originally from Louisiana? And I think I picked up that you're not. I was born in Denver, Colorado. Okay. So I, I lived in the Rocky Mountains for a few years, but I did all my schooling here in, in Lafayette or in, in Baton Rouge. Um, so I, I went to, at the time, Plantation, now Middlebrook Elementary, um, graduated from Como. So right down the road and, uh, and then went off to LSU. So I'm, a, I'm as, as Louisiana as you can get. Yeah, Without yeah. any accent or last name. No E-A-U-X in my last name. Oh, yeah. gosh. Yeah, right. Um, what? When did you move to Louisiana? When I was five. So oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh, dude. Late 80s. Yeah, I mean, you're practically, I mean, you're practically from here. Let's just, yeah, yeah let's yeah, call my it kids that. Are, my kids were born in Louisiana, so, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they're technically more Louisiana than I am, but, um, <laughs> but this is, this, this is my home, and I think, you know, most people who are from Louisiana are steadfast, love this place, and, and I hear from people all over the country through all of our different offerings and swamp programs how much they love this state, and when they leave, how much they miss it. And that was a really important thing for me, too. When I moved out of state, I fell in love with Louisiana. Like when you sit, sit here and you're just you're going through high school and everything, you're like, right. I don't know what this place has to offer me. <laughs> and you don't know what you got until you leave. And you really, I fell in love with it. I, I had a new, you know, excitement for the festivals and everything that I didn't have when I was younger. So um, for anybody who's kind of struggling with wanting to leave Louisiana, you know, give it a chance and, and you'll see how beautiful and, and amazing this place is. Of course, the people yeah. really bring people to want people to stay. And I, and I love that. I, I mean, I see a lot of younger people, uh, you know, in their early 20s, you know, they want to move. They want to go to a different city. And I and I, I I'm all for that. Um, I wanted to move to Vegas early in my 20s for graphic design because it's, you know, tons of graphic um, advertising and billboards and all the different things that you can literally put graphics on is out in Vegas. Um, but then I thought to myself, I'm like, what else is in Vegas that would keep me there? And it would just be work. I don't want to live in Vegas. And having traveled to Vegas few, uh, a few times, I would ask the people working there, do you like living here? And they would right. tell me no. They just, they just, they're just here to work. And people love living here. Yeah. yeah. People love living in Louisiana. 
And I get it. Louisiana has its uh, backwards moments. Uh, like, for example, you mentioned, you know, the con- conservational side of, you know, the swamp and just how it's portrayed and, you know, all that good stuff. Um, but there's a lot of beauty here. And the food is obviously second to none. The culture here, however you want to describe the culture, uh, it there's I don't think there's one s- specific culture here. It's a very weird, and I hate to use the word melting pot because I feel like that's an overused term. Um, but it, I mean, it is, it's, there's so many different types that, you know, we all just meld together and we were able to go down the street, like at a festival and just kind of hang out with everybody and like talk, we, we talk to people as if we know them and we don't know them. Like right. we just, we, we say, Hey, to people in other cities saying, Hey, to people, especially not in the South that, why are you talking to me? Yeah. Like, especially yeah. in New York, you're like, you don't, you don't just walk down the street and go, Hey, how's it going? They they would look at you funny. <laughs> so I love that about Louisiana. And, but I do encourage people that if you want to explore out, go do that. But just know that if you do have any family here and if you do like good food, you'll probably be back. Cause I know a lot of people who came back. Right. So yeah. just, yeah, that's my story. And I, yep. I would do it all over again. So just just uh, forewarn you, if you if you do leave, you might be back. And if you're not going to come back, you're going to visit. You're going to want to come back. Anyway, um, all right. So uh, before we wrap up, um, kind of tell me a little bit more about the Swamp Tours side of your work uh, with the, the McGee um, work. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so it, that we purchased McGee's at the end of 2016. McGee's has been kind of the, you know, a one kind of swamp tour company here in, in South central Louisiana for, for decades. They've been offering tours since the late seventies. Uh, we purchased it through our swamp base program. Okay. So we've been looking for a home for, for swamp base and the, and the scouting and getting more youth involved in the Atchafalaya. And so when we purchased it at the end of 2016, we, we had a great opportunity to, to have a swamp tour company that would be able to serve schools as well as travelers from all over the, all over the world. And, it's been amazing to be able to have the opportunity to, to share this environment with so many people from so many different backgrounds and have an opportunity to basically create what their opinion now is of this place. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's locals coming through for the first time or for the, you know, 10 or 20th time, uh, we get a chance <clears throat> to show the absolute best that Louisiana has to offer. And, and kind of back to the idea of, you know, people – you know, being from here and maybe leaving, it's time for us to have more pride in the place that we have, you know, right here in Louisiana. I mean, this, we've got an amazing state with some ex- excellent attributes to it. And we got to stop thinking about the negative stuff and really start thinking about all the great positive things we have. I mean, we are our best advocates for, for Louisiana. And if we want to see a better Louisiana, we have to start talking about ourselves I agree. in the right way. I agree. And so, so McGee's, you know, we do airboats and swamp tours out there. We offer paddling excursions as well. And it, it's great to be able to have people come out and, and, and see the swamp for the first time and, and leave with a, a newfound experience and hopefully a lifetime memory. Yeah. All right. So I have been wanting to go on an airboat ride forever. I've never been on an airboat. I that see be, them. That should, be, that should be a bucket list item. That should be. It, yeah. I think it is. But I, I just, I never, I never could, I guess, find myself in that position to be like, oh, I'm going on an airboat ride today. Like, <laughs> so tell me a little bit about it's I see it's 90 minutes. Yep. And obviously the video in the beginning of the website. So if, if you want to go to the website, if you want to look at it, just if you're listening, it's McGee Swamp Tours.com. Just Google it. That's what I did. Um so what I see they 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 make stops. So like what is the tour kind of about? Like what what area do you offer food? Like if it's 90 minute, do you offer snacks? Like what is, tell me kind of a little bit about the, the tour. So it's, I mean, it's an immersive experience in the sense of that you're going to go through the diverse swamp lands that we have out there. Uh, we've got all local guides, whether we're doing our airboats or our swamp tours, and they're going to basically share with you kind of, you know, their experiences of growing up in the area. They're going to talk about the wildlife, which is obviously the big, big draw for people. The alligators are obviously still the, the biggest draw. Uh, and depending on the time of the year, whether we're talking about migrating birds coming through, uh, water level changes, like with the drawdown we had this past fall. So, 
you're leaving being educated about this. You know, we'll do it. We'll throw in a couple little, you know, corny jokes here and there to, yeah. to keep you laughing and entertained. But our goal since we purchased the property in the company was to make sure that people leave educated with it. And whether that's somebody who's in their, you know, eighties going out on an airboat or swamp tour, or somebody who's just a, a young child coming out and it's their first experience. We have uh, what we feel kind of our responsibility to be able to, to showcase it in the best possible light. And so it's, a hundred percent about teaching people along the way. Um, but it's going to be thrilling too. you know, when you get the alligators coming up to the side of the boat or kind of cutting in through the cypress trees and, and kind of chasing, you know, the, the birds as they're flying away. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful place. And even locals, you know, need to be able to go out there and spend more time seeing it. Okay. Dude, now I'm excited. I was just looking at the, uh, the website here and I was curious to see how much it would be. And it's about kind of where I thought it would be yeah. in, in that $50 range per person. Um, we spend a lot of money on gas. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure. I mean, just looking at that image here, um, I'll go back to it real quick. Um, oh, it's on here. Yep. Just looking at this boat. I mean, those engines are not small engines. No, those are like Chevy 350 size we, engines. We have a 550 horsepower engine on the back. Of yeah. And they're loud too. So that's why you have the ear protection. We don't recommend, um, you know, guests that are under five years old being on the airboat just because of maturity levels more than anything. And, you know, loud noises can impact a young kid and just kind of get them squirming and everything. Yeah. So we want to make sure that they are able to sit still and be able to enjoy the experience safely. Okay. So my little boy, he's six. Yeah, he'd he, be able to go. Okay. Okay. Yep. He he does get he does get a little excited. So I'm I'm curious it's I, I would love to take him on this. I would want to go on this myself. Um, but I think he would love it. So now the swamp tour is going to have more narration. It's in a, kind of a enclosed boat, larger boat. Yeah. And so if you've got a, a six year old who doesn't want to sit still all that, all that often, uh, that's a really great one too, because you got a guide who's going to narrate the entire 90 minutes and talk about the place. You know, when you go underneath the basin bridge and you got to see, see that firsthand and learn about the engineering of it, but getting the alligators to come up to the side of the boat for a young kid and just being on the water in general is going to be a really great experience. for Yeah. Them. All right, man. I'm excited now because now I'm 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 gonna look into doing a, a boat tour. When's the best time to do one of these tours? When's the most popular time is going to be usually spring and fall. Obviously, because you know, it's obviously not hot. it's like the right time. Um, but we are usually busy throughout the summertime as well. It just okay. depends on what you're wanting to see. If you're wanting to see gators, you're not going to see them as much in December or January. But you'll see other things. Yeah. Um, you'll see fall color in October, November. So there's really just seasonally, you can go back just like as, as a photographer, I'm always back out there because there's something to see as the seasons change. Right. You know, Louisiana isn't known for seasons, but we actually have them out there in the swamps. Awesome. All right. So um, we are approaching an hour. Oh God, we're at an hour. So before we go, I want to go ahead and throw up your website here, benpiercephotography.com. So if you want to screenshot that, uh, please do check out his website. Uh, and if you want to take a quick glimpse of it, I'll pull it up right here for you. So this is kind of what to expect. It's a very clean website, just like any photographer's website should be. Uh, focus on the photos. I mean, that photo right there, that is beautiful. Like That guy actually got in my way. I was, I was not intending for that to be the photo. Dude, the, he got what, in the way. That's not in the, like, that is not in the way at all. That is the best Louisiana, like, come on, a boater? Like, that's perfect. I was perfect. trying to catch the sun rising between the spans of the bridge, and I was like, man, he's going to make all the ripples in the water. Uh, it ended up being a great shot, right? So no, sometimes yeah, the, totally great. You know, uh, planning for something else, and then I ended up getting that one out of it. So it was pretty awesome, you know, consolation and, prize. Yeah, and this one, I mean, you, you have, oh, gosh, dude. Some New Orleans shots. Yeah, like. That's UL's camp. That's at Cypress Lake on UL's Yeah, campus. that's just in Lafayette. Yep. Yeah. Really great stuff. I mean, just the the amount of depth that a lot of these photos have is, uh, is that an oil slick? I, I dabble in some macro stuff every once in a while. That's All actually, right. That's actually bubbles. Wow. Okay. Yep. So, yeah. Um, and you can look up all the different uh, images here. I'm pretty sure you have a ton more that are not on here. but Oh, yeah. Uh, or of course, panoramas and the panoramas are really cool. Uh, of course, you saw one with the cityscape of uh, New Orleans, and then you got this guy right here. Like that, that looks like one of the ones you, you it was, talked yeah, about. I, yep. I did a panorama version yep. as well as out there. If you see the orange one in the image, uh, that was the shot I was going to go for. Oh right wow! Well. Okay, so that was the, that was the intent, and I ended up being able to get it as well. But that was a second a second attempt going out there at a different time. Yeah. See now. 
So you have two great photos. You have this one and then the boater. The boater, though, is like, like quintessentially yeah. Louisiana, but this is great, great, too. All right, man. I can, I can, <laughs> I can, we, we, obviously, I could look at these photos all day long. Um, but Ben, um, it was great having you on and talking about your photography and your connections with the, um, the swamp base with that and the, the McGee swamp tours. So, uh, I look forward to continuing to follow your, your work. And obviously, um, I, I, I'll, 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 I, I will go ahead and say this. I was a little bit jealous that one of your posts got like thousands of views, like thousands of reactions. I'm like, but you know what? He's he's photographing Louisiana and its beauty. And I'm like, you know what? That's 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 going to be an easy, <laughs> easy win right there. Like I could go out there and take a photo of a, a scenery and probably get some good stuff. You but shared a beautiful one on my page. About yes, <laughs> I, I did. I, I probably would have shown it. But I didn't want to show up your work. I, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and I took it with my iPhone. I was like, you know what? I'm going to show Ben this. And I took it knowing that this photo is going to be sent to Ben. Like I, It was like in our <laughs> residential neighborhood's pond. And the sun was setting. And it was like right behind a tree. And I'm like, and I think it might have been a cypress tree or like some form of a Louisiana tree. I'm like, got to get a photo of it. And I'm going to post it to his Facebook page. I'm telling you, Ben Powers photography is going to be the next big thing. No, it's KDM. not. God. <laughs> look, I'm not like you're you're good. You don't have to worry about me. <laughs> I like taking photos of construction sites and uh, renovations. I'm I'm doing pretty good with that. I'll stick with that. But Ben, it was great having you on and I and I look forward to seeing all the the, the work you do and hopefully I can take a swamp tour soon. So that'll be cool. So yeah, thank you for coming on and tell talking a little bit about your your work and telling us a little bit about you. And I know you in your um your information, you said you also have a wife, Chrissy, and two children that are 14 and 10 years old. So that's cool. I didn't realize you had, yep. you had uh, I know you said you had kids, but I didn't realize they were that mature. So, um, yeah, so shout out to your wife and two kids if they're if they're watching. Um, yeah, anyway, have a great rest of your day. Happy St. Patrick's Day, even though I don't see a single. Oh, you got a little bit of green with the gator. I, I had to rep the brand. Yes. You know? Hey, but the green's there. <laughs> You're not going to get pinched today. <laughs> And uh, honestly, I almost forgot that it was St. Patrick's Day. I was looking through what T-shirt I'm going to wear today. I'm like, ah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to wear the Festo International. Uh, I like uh, that one a lot, yeah. too. Yeah. So I was like, oh, and, and I was like, wait, it's green. It's I, I think I had to ask Siri, so today is St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> sure enough, it was. Anyway, uh, I'm done rambling. Uh, thank you guys for watching. And if you want to watch uh, or you want to listen to the audio version of the podcast, it'll be up hopefully this week. I have a few more to edit. So if you are an avid audio listener, and you follow us there and you haven't seen any new episodes in about a week or two, uh, don't worry, I'm getting it. So anyway, uh, Ben, have a great day. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming out. Thank you so much. All right, guys, that is it. We'll see you on the next one.